Good. All good. All right. I think we're going to go ahead and get started here today. So once again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm here today. My name is Michaela Freeman. I'm from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And along with my colleagues at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, we're excited to bring you this Marine Energy Career Panel. This is actually the second one we've done. The last one, the first one was last year. Um, so we're really excited to be doing this event again. So first, what I'm going to do is give an overview of our national labs. Um, and we're just going to give you a very, very quick overview of kind of the work that we do here um, in the three national labs that we'll be highlighting today. So first, um, we represent the panelists as well as myself, uh, the Pacific Northwest National Lab, PNNL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL, and Sandia National Laboratories, all from the U.S. Department of Energy. So as you can see on this slide here in the two images, the US Department of Energy or DOE has 17 national labs. Each of these have different focuses, but typically address different national priorities such as energy, the environment and climate. And you can see on the map here where the different labs are located and they're placed strategically across the country. Um, and we have highlighted NREL and PNNL. I realize I forgot to put a circle around Sandia. Apologies about that. Um, but you can see Sandia uh, just south of NREL at the bottom of the map there. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick overview of PNNL. I'm going to pass it to our colleague Kelly to talk about Sandia and then Ariel to talk about NREL. And then we're going to go through uh, panelist introductions, have a little Q&A and open discussion. And then we're going to provide some uh, resources for opportunities for those interested in a career in marine energy. Um, so we're really excited to have you here today with us. Um, and I forgot to note that we are recording this um, and we'll post the recording online on the TPIS website after the event. So first, uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory or PNNL, it's located in the state of Washington. And our main campus is in Eastern Washington and Richland. You can see on the right side of the map here. Uh, we also have a marine uh, laboratory in Squim, Washington, out on the peninsula on the left side of the map. And we are actually the only marine lab in the DOE national system. So across PNNL, we have about 6,000 researchers divided among these locations, as well as a few others and tons of remote employees like myself or virtual employees. Um, and we, a lot of the work that we do specifically, my team, um, some of the folks here on this webinar is with marine energy, but PNNL does a whole host of other research, including national security and other focus. Um, so generally we work on climate change, sustainable energy, as I mentioned with the emphasis on marine energy. Um, and we often are mostly funded by the US Department of Energy. So you'll hear about them throughout the day today. Um, and a couple projects that are signature to our marine energy work at PNNL that uh, you'll see represented today are Ocean Energy Systems or OES Environmental and Triton, both of which focus on environmental effects of marine energy. But I do want to note that we don't only look at environmental effects of marine energy, and we have researchers and staff that look across the whole spectrum of marine energy, working on engineering, modeling, and other fields. Uh, so with that, I'm going to pass it to Kelly. Hi, so I'm Kelly, work at Sandy National Laboratories. Oh, looks like the colors changed quite a bit on this, so apologies on that. Um, so Sandia National Laboratories history is traced to the Manhattan Project. If any of you all watched the movie Oppenheimer, you know, you're pretty familiar with the history of the Manhattan Project. And historically, the role of Sandia is the engineering laboratory. So a lot of the fundamental science, the physicists, the physicists of the Manhattan Project were based in Los Alamos, New Mexico. And um, Sandia National Laboratories was the engineering laboratory that was responsible for, you know, fabrication and um, we're located on the Air Force Base. So um, we have a pretty unique mission from the different laboratories. And that Mission has evolved over the decades. Um, I, I mentioned we're physically located in Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, and also in Livermore, California. 
Um, I think that we are the largest laboratory. We have about 14,000 people in New Mexico and 2,000 people in California. And if I can draw your attention to that um, spin wheel, pinwheel at the top, you can see that we are multi-mission laboratories. So that means that in addition to um, our global security and national security, nuclear deterrence and advanced science and technology thrusts, um, we also focus on energy and homeland security. So all of the work that CNDIA does um, for renewables and marine energy falls within that portfolio. Um, our, and our mission is very broad in that space. So I think I'll pass it to Arielle now. Awesome, thanks Kelly. We can move to the next slide. Awesome, so I um, am with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. So we go by NREL since we love acronyms in the government. Um, so NREL started actually off as um, the Solar Energy Research Institute back in, I think the seventies. Um, so it was called CIRI. Um, we are the only national lab that is only focused on renewable energy technologies. So um, looking kind of towards the right of this slide first, NREL at a glance, we've got 3,600 that, uh, yes, so 3,600 or so work, uh, workers. Um, we work in anything from renewable energy, sustainable transportation and fuels, buildings and industry and energy systems in, in um, integration. We partner across industry, academia, government, um, and we do have four campuses. Our main campus is located in Colorado, um, but we do have campuses in Alaska, in California, I honestly don't know where the fourth one is, and I probably should find that out, but uh, kudos to anybody who can who can jump in there with that <laughs> answer. And then if you look on the right to the slide, looking at water power specifically, um, the, the text here is talking more about our recent accomplishments, but we've had a water power program here um, since probably the same as PNL and l uh, in Sandia since about 2009. Um, we're looking both at marine energy and hydropower. Um, from a research perspective, uh, looking at anything from improving, improving performance and effectiveness, identifying energy and non-energy opportunities in hydropower, um, and looking at pump storage hydro. Uh, we have most recently uh, deployed a Hero WEC device, which has gotten some, some cool and fun press with some good results. Um, and yeah, looking at uh, how to help on the regulation side for, for hydropower as well. So that's just a brief glimpse on what we do on water power. Um, and yeah, with that, I think we can go to the next slide and we'll start introducing the panelists. Um, so we have a wonderful group of panelists today representing the three national labs that you just heard about. Um, and we're gonna go through them one at a time with introductions and then we'll go to questions. Uh, but at any point in time, if anybody has any questions for the panelists, please throw them in the chat. We'll do our best to get to all the questions that are asked. Um, so yeah, if we could go to the next slide. Lisa, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and talk about your career. Thanks, Aria. So hi, everyone. I am Lisa Garavelli. I'm a research scientist at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. I am based in Seattle, Washington. Um, so I have a background in biology and ecology. So I studied in France mostly as you probably can hear. Um, so I have a Bachelor of Science in Marine Environment, a Master of Science in Oceanography, and a PhD in biolog Biological Oceanography. Um, and this was already like 10 years ago, a bit more. Um, after I studied in France, I did my postdoc in uh, Florida Atlantic University. So I went there for three years and I was mainly working on fisheries management and doing like modeling. So looking at population dynamic for uh, fisheries management. I joined the Pacific Northwest National Lab in 2017 as a postdoctoral research associate. I did that for a year and I was like hired as a research scientist after that. I now work in the coastal science division that Michaela uh, introduce and my focus is a bit broad really like all related to biology ecology uh but uh how we tie that how i like i am tying all of this research to marine energy now so i work on environmental effects of marine energy and i mainly work on the oes the ocean energy system environmental project that we can probably uh, share a link also i would do that in the chat 
I work also on collocating aquaculture and marine energy, and this is mainly looking at using marine energy to power aquaculture operation. So we are uh, working on the feasibility of doing that. And this is all related to what we call the powering the blue economy. And I also work on uh, like other, you know, like industry looking at offshore wind, like interaction between offshore wind and environment, offshore wind and fisheries, and doing some uh, larval dispersal modeling work for invasive species, which is not related to marine energy, but at the national lab, we do a lot of um, different work and not necessarily related to marine energy. And in my free time, I do, uh, I really like traveling. I put some picture of my last trip in Indonesia. I do like walking on the beach, even if it's Seattle, but the beach is a bit too cold in my opinion, but it's nice to walk there and see some nice sunset. And um, yeah, that's what I have today. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Lisel. And just before we go to the next presenter, just wanted to mention, um, we put this in the chat too, but if you want to ask any questions, there's the Q&A feature in the chat. Please use the Q&A and therefore everybody will be able to see it. So just a little more housekeeping there, but all right, I think uh, we're ready for the next slide. And Andrew, please go ahead and tell us about yourself. Thanks, Ariel. My name is Andrew Sims. I'm a researcher working on data science at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. I have a degree in business from the University of Colorado, and I'm currently working on my master's degree in data science. I used to be a technician at NREL. That's where I started on the left. Um, you can see me and Mark Murphy. He's the technician who I trained under. Um, we built data acquisition systems for marine energy devices, and we also worked on instrumentation. Um, on the left there, too, there's a strain gauge. That's one of the instruments we would install. And part of my job was to build these systems and test them out. And then part of it was to travel and install them. And that was a pretty awesome piece. Um, in the middle, we can see a picture of Waves to Water. That's one of the projects we got to sort of observe and help with. And that's me on the left. And then there's Molly on the right there. And then at the bottom, that's all the places we've got to travel to. So we go out to Hawaii. I've been there once for work. And then um, I've been to Nevada and a couple others in there. We went to North Carolina a lot and a couple times to Texas. And in my free time, I'm going to school right now, so I don't have a lot of free time. But on the upper uh, right, that's a sunset in San Diego. That was a nice vacation we went to. And then on the uh, far right, that's a visualization from one of the classes that I'm taking where we're try I was trying to figure out um, some metrics for buying a house, which I'm hopefully going to do in the next couple of years here. And I work on um, data analysis right now for the Water Power Technology Validation Group. A couple of projects I'm working on now is MHKit, which is software for data analysis. And we're working also to try to figure out how to process our data in the cloud and doing some machine learning. And all of this is on time series data. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew. All right, next slide. So Kelly, please go ahead. Hi, so me again, <laughs> Kelly, Sandia National Laboratories. Um, uh, my background is mechanical engineering. I went to a small uh, teaching school in Indiana called Rose Holman Institute of Technology. So um, they don't have uh, graduate programs there. Um, so I um, knew I wanted to go into research. I did some like um, research experience for undergraduate programs outside of my um, undergraduate education, which led me to um, going to Oregon State University, um, where I also had a background in mechanical engineering, but I also focused in ocean engineering. Um, and specifically, my focus when I was at Oregon State was on ocean wave energy. So that's really how I got into this field. Um, I, I started as an intern at Sandia, actually, while I was pursuing my master's degree. And um, that turned into a full-time position. And I have, uh, I thought I'd be there a couple of years and here I am well over a decade later still at Sandia. So, um, and I've been fortunate enough to, to always work in marine energy and renewable energy at Sandia. Um, so I currently sit within the, the climate, Sandia's Climate Center. Um, in terms of my background and, and research um, at Sandia, got some fun pictures of a device that we built and tested at Oregon State University. It's called the FOSWAC. 
Um, and we uh, generated a validation data set for the open source software um, that we developed jointly between CND and NREL called the Wave Energy Converter Simulator or WEXIM. I've been the lead developer at Sandia for Wexim since it started, which is almost a decade ago now from our first release. Um, it won an R&D 100 award a couple of years ago. Um, and some other things I've worked on are the Wave Energy Prize. And currently we support a lot of um, industry and universities on numerical modeling support using Wexim through the, the Teamer program, if you're familiar. Um, I realized that I did not update the focus area, so please disregard the focus comments on the bottom right. My apologies on that. Um, but the personal pictures are, are me. Um, I'm a runner. I also love to travel and hike, and that's my dog, uh, Pumpkin. So, Pumpkin. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Um, all right. Next slide. Justin, it's all you. Thanks, Ariel. Uh, my name is Justin Panzarella. I'm currently a mechanical engineering graduate intern at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, where I work on the HeroWEC project. Um, I studied mechanical engineering as an undergrad at Grove City College and graduated in 2021. Currently, I am uh, in my last semester of a master's degree program in mechanical engineering at Colorado School of Mines. Um, for photos, I have a photo of my senior design project as an undergrad where we designed and built and raced a uh, four-wheel drive Baja car. Um, outside of college, my career experience has been a couple of internships, one in uh, aerospace hydraulics and one in automotive. And uh, currently, I've been intern at NREL since uh, June of 2023. Uh, for photos of that, I have a photo of the HeroWeck on one of its previous deployments, as well as a photo of our uh, LAMP test platform. It sort of stands for uh, Large Amplitude Motion Platform. And we have been using that to test the HeroWeck recently. Um, so at NREL, I have the opportunity to work on a lot of uh, a wide range of aspects on the HeroWeck project, including design, test setup, data processing, and uh, modeling in Simulink at Wexum. Um, outside, and my, sorry, my focus on the HeroWeck project is lab testing and component system design. I also do a lot of uh, data analysis. And outside of work and school, I'm into rock climbing, skiing, and mountaineering. Awesome. Thanks, Justin. All right. Ready for the next slide? And I believe, Molly, you are going to finish us out. Great. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Molly Greer. Um, I actually kind of started my, my career at the lab right after undergrad. I got a, a post-bachelor's research associate job at PNNL, um, which let me just explore a ton of different things that PNNL had to offer, everything from looking at the environmental effects of marine energy to a little bit of engineering. And what was really cool about that job is um, I got really interested in a specific question that we were working on at the lab. And then I was able to take that question at the lab and, and kind of parlay that and work on it in grad school. So um, I started grad school uh, at University of Washington, um, and I wanted to really understand what would happen if a tidal turbine were to collide with a marine mammal. Um, and so you can see in one of my pictures, uh, it's a piece of uh, seal skin, and I got to work on a whole bunch of different animals um, where we would pull and push and stretch the skin to try to understand how squishy it was and how collapsible it was and how breakable it was, and then ultimately feed that back into models that would let us understand if a tidal turbine collided with a marine animal, how bad would that injury look like? Would it, get, would it injure the bone? Would it break the skin? Um, and all that was really cool research. Um, by the time I finished grad school, um, while I really liked all that engineering stuff, um, I ended up kind of feeling like some of the hardest problems in marine energy were not necessarily the engineering problems, but instead were the policy problems. Um, so I decided to take uh, a couple years uh, in DC trying to figure out how do we do marine policy on the national scale. Um, I worked for the National Science Foundation as their ocean policy specialist 
which helped coordinate ocean policy across a bunch of different um, federal agencies. And I learned a lot about all those different agencies' role in um, national ocean policy, but ultimately uh, felt like after trying my hand at national ocean policy, thought that I was better fit uh, again to be an engineer. So I came back to CNNL in 2020. Um, still with like kind of a, a little bit of an affinity about policy, but, but mostly wanting to work on research projects and to be able to, you know, uh, steer like a smaller ship into more different directions as opposed to trying to steer like the national ship, you know, just a little tiny bit. Um, so since then at PNNL, I've gotten to work on a couple of different projects. One of my favorite, which I've highlighted here, uh, is a, a little tidal turbine um, that we put strain gauges on to try to see uh, if we could detect uh, a marine mammal approaching it. Um, and so then we could like change how the, the, the turbine behaves right before a collision and reduce the collision. So that's kind of builds on my PhD work. But then I've also gotten to expand a lot from my PhD work. Um, things like looking at coastal communities and how they might be interested in different energy transitions, looking at marine energy uh, for different small scale applications from ocean observing to aquaculture, um, assessing feasibility of marine energy for different communities. Um, and then finally, I have some hobbies here. I really like knitting things. I'm sitting here during this meeting knitting a sweater. Um, and I also uh, <laughs> like to uh, do some watercolors and stuff like that. So you can see those. Pass it back to Ariel. All right, thanks, Molly. Um, so yeah, we have a wonderfully diverse uh, panel with various backgrounds, and I know that um, uh, there's definitely going to be questions coming in from from people online. But we have a few um, that we wanted to ask to get people starting to think about the types of questions um, that they should ask. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, but again, as a reminder, people put your questions into the the Q and A. Um, but just kind of walking through how you all found your subject matter like did you have an aha moment like what brought you to you know what you do now and what advice would you give to people to get into your field or pursue you know what they they're passionate about um yeah I don't know does anybody want to just go for it and start I can call people too I can start it's not, a, I don't, I just have an aha moment. I think what people need to be is curious and very open because a lot of time and a lot of people I know, they didn't know anything about marine energy. Um, and I mean, in my case, I was doing fisheries management, like environmental effect of anthropogenic, you know, industry, like anthropogenic effects and like other industry. And if what I've done is that was, is applicable to marine energy. But yeah, it was very like taking opportunities and talking to people and realizing that my skill would be transferable. Um, so yeah, being curious and open is a probably a big one. Cool, yeah. Kelly, did you wanna add to that? Yeah, so um, I kind of glossed over this on my introduction slide, but I actually studied abroad in, in Germany for a year during my undergraduate, and at the time it was like late 2000s, um, there were a lot of wind farms and solar farms all over Germany, and that wasn't the case in the US, and so that really drove my passion to work in renewable energy and be a part of that energy transition, um, and so I, I mentioned I had interest in going to graduate school and uh, doing research. And so I started looking into renewable energy graduate programs uh, across the country and got really interested in marine energy. And so that's actually how I ended up at Oregon State um, is I, I really wanted to work in marine energy, but it was really that like aha moment of, of traveling around and, and wanting to be a part of that energy transition. Awesome. Thanks, Justin. I'm, I'm very curious to hear because, you know, you had automated motive background and, you know, and now you're working for a national lab as an intern. Yeah. What, what brought you into this world? Yeah. So uh, from an engineering perspective, I really enjoy working on more challenging problems. And uh, I've seen that a lot through uh, with, well, especially with my senior design project as an undergrad, um, it was the most challenge. It seemed to be the most challenging and largest option available for senior design projects. So um, that's also a lot of what I see with marine energy. It's a new field. There's a lot of new challenges. There 
aren't a uh, ton of standards and uh, major designs that are already existing out there. Uh, we're developing a lot of new, new technology here. So that's really what drew me uh, to apply for this internship last year. Um, my, However, I also have to say that I had a very small exposure to marine energy before that. Um, I first learned about marine energy in, I believe, either middle school or freshman year of high school and decided to do a science fair project where I built uh, small wave energy converters and tested them on Lake Erie and in Chesapeake Bay. Um, none of them produced much power, but it was a very interesting experience. I think one of them sank, uh, but made me aware of it marine energy could be a major part of the future and uh, that this does exist and there's a lot of engineering work that goes into it. Awesome. Andrew, Molly, anything that you want to add? I think for me, I'm not, I, I have a business degree, so I'm probably the outlier here, but for me, I really wanted to take a chance. And I think um, my first, my second day at NREL, I got to climb a wind turbine. That was my introduction to being a technician and that was probably one of the coolest things I've ever done we did that I did that for like a year and a half and then I worked in water power I got a job in water power and I think doing something that's excites you can be like a tricky thing to kind of transition into in your career like sometimes it's like you're getting pushed to do something that's you know not dangerous is the wrong word but like you know something that is more safe and I think for me, it took kind of like motivation to do something that was really exciting. And that, that really helped me in my career. Yeah, I think my answer is a lot of what everyone else said, but like, I was really looking for some sort of career that would let me just try a lot of different things and learn a lot of different things every day. You know, like one day you're doing marine biology, the next day you're doing engineering, the next day, uh, you know, you're talking to a community, the next day you're climbing on something in the ocean and all of that is a lot of what makes me feel like this is the right career for me. Awesome. Yeah, I love that. So yeah, take, take opportunities that you have and acknowledge that this is a really challenging field, but that can be a good thing and you can really kind of do many different things within the industry to help it move along. That's great. Um, I'm going to ask one more question to you all, and I see we have some chat uh, questions coming in through the chat, so we'll prioritize those. But um, just wanted to get a sense from you all. You have such different jobs. Um, what does your day-to-day -day look like? If you could just walk through, like, do you have a day-to-day? -day? Like, is it similar on a day? Yeah, what, what, is, what does your work life look like? Um, let's start. We can go backwards now. How about Molly? Do you want to start with that? Sure. Um... I feel like mine's very varied. Um, we uh, recently started going back to the office a little bit. I'm also based in Seattle. And so maybe one or two days a week, I go into the office. So I'm currently at my home office. Um, I also tend to do a, a quite a bit of traveling for work, um, which can be everything from conferences where you're kind of presenting scientific information and chatting with other um, scientists. Or about two weeks ago, I was at an oyster farm in California and we uh, picked up an instrument that we'd put under the water to measure how fast the currents were going at that oyster farm. Um, and yeah, so it can be really varied. And I, I, I really like that. I like a little bit of balance of it all. Andrew. Um, I'm the type of person being a technician, um, I like being in the office. So me, I actually sit right across from Justin. Um, I go into the office every day. I try to get there early. That was kind of being a technician, but um, my day-to-day -day is some meetings, some data processing. I work mostly in Python, um, trying to collaborate with people, try to talk to people, figure out what they're working on. And then my primary task is to try to take the data, turn it into understanding, and then turn that into action on the side of the engineers. And part of the challenge is we collect a lot of data. And so to really look at it and really do a good job takes a person to kind of get into the details. And that's really what I've learned a lot in my career is to look at the details and to get into the small things. So most of my day is trying to put my headphones on and really focus and get into the zone where I can look at the details of the data that we're generating. Cool, thanks. Yeah, Justin, what about you? 
Um, yeah, so this is probably my favorite thing about this internship is that it varies a lot from day to day. Um, there are days where I'm doing a lot of CAD work and designing mechanical components for HeroEC. Uh, there have also been a lot of days where I've been in the lab working on the large amplitude motion platform testing. Uh, most recently, I've spent a lot of days working with Andrew on processing and analyzing the HeroEC data that we collected from that. And uh, I also spend a lot of time uh, in Simulink and MATLAB um, refining the model of the HeroEx system. So it varies a lot and day-to-day uh, -day it's not the same for more than a couple days in a row until you get through a task. Kelly, what about you? It wasn't letting me on mute. Sorry about that. Um, my day varies a lot as well. However, since I do do a lot of numerical modeling and simulation, I do probably spend more time in the office and in front of a computer than maybe some of the other people who have already spoken. Um, yeah, but I mean, I also, you know, present at conferences, do panels like this. Um, for, and, and I've run some experimental testing and um, been involved in experimental testing a few different times um, and, and done some open water testing as well. So there are times I get to go to a wave lab or be on a boat. Um, those are more rare for me, but um, it is it's certainly part of the job and the, and the travel for, for meetings and conferences and, and those types of testing is also pretty common. Wow. <laughs> And yeah, I do a lot of computer work. Um, I I mean, I'm lucky that two weeks ago I was in a very nice conference in Colombia, the Pan American Marine Energy Conference, which was great. Uh, so we do a lot of conferences for sure, and it helps a lot, a lot of networking with that, and helps creating collaboration. I think we what we do a lot, unfortunately, is I mean. It's good and sometimes bad. It's a lot of meetings, uh, but he helps a lot in brainstorming. And I work with um, big like project who have big teams, so it's great. Actually, really nice to have now hybrid meetings where we use that to brainstorm and having great like good ideas. And like sometimes the meeting are like work meetings, sometimes more brainstorming. Um, so we do that a lot. Like writing publication is part of our job, so we do that. Um, and I. I don't do a lot of field work, but when I do, it's fun. And I like the last one was tagging fish uh, and releasing them in the Columbia River to see if they survive through a, a, a dam. So that was cool. Excellent. Yeah, so I'm hearing a lot of day-to-day -day variations um, and opportunities to, to travel and uh, get the word out about your work, which is awesome, uh, my experience as well. Um, all right, so we have a lot of great questions in the chat. Some of them are uh, specific towards various panelists. So I'm just gonna start running through them. Um, so the first one that we have here is from Molly. And the question is, um, what was the working environment like when you decided to work in policy? And then how would you compare it to the engineering environment at National Labs? Ooh, uh, that's a good question. Um, so I was in DC in 2019. 20, well, I guess it's 2018 to 20 to mid 2020. Um, and so you can kind of uh, guess some of the, the sort of politics that were happening there. Um, in some in, in ways, in some ways, um, as like administrations change or that kind of thing, you have to sort of think about how you are messaging what you're trying to do. And that was a really big challenge for me. Um, as someone who is an engineer who like, you know, kind of like, is like the facts are the facts. I, I, I wasn't always great at sort of like switching. Okay, if I'm talking to Noah, for example, like I really need to focus on like that, that like basic oceanography versus sometimes I'm talking to the Navy, um, how, I, how I sort of like switch, how I'm talking to talk more about their, their mission space. Um, and that was a real challenge for me. So as I've been back at the lab, it's been really great to sort of talk uh, to scientists who I feel like we, we all kind of speak the same language from the beginning and that's been uh, a real, that's made it easier and that that work environment is easier. Um, but at the same time, it was a huge like fast paced challenge to be in DC and have to have to like kind of understand everyone's motivations all the time. Um, but there was some of that kind of like politicking to try to understand different different viewpoints and, and, and change your mission a little bit for that. Um, but ultimately, 
it was not my greatest strength. <laughs> Awesome. Um, so I'm gonna um, target this next one towards Kelly. Um, so this is a question about um, uh, the passion in modeling, design, simulation, control, and optimization of wax and underwater turbines, um, but not seeing a lot of openings, um, job openings in that area. Um, and so how would you recommend getting involved in this space and in pursuing work specifically as it relates to modeling? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I mentioned I started as an intern, uh, Justin is an intern now, right, he, he's doing numerical modeling and simulation, so I definitely would encourage people to um, look at internship options, it's a really great way to get your foot in the door, and I also think of internships as like a two way interview, you know, they're interviewing you and learning about your skills, um, but you also get the experience of you know, seeing if you enjoy that, that work environment. So I think that's a really great start. Um, you know, other opportunities are at universities, I would say, um, you know, looking for professors that, that do that type of work and applying to programs in that area, that, that certainly helps. Um, and of course, in industry, you know, they, they need those skills as well. Um, I would say the marine energy industry is, is pretty small and there's not a lot of companies that have you know dedicated staff that that do that type of work they do exist I just mean that especially in these smaller companies um, people tend to wear a lot of different hats so if your focus is on uh, doing exclusively numerical modeling I, I think that um, probably the university or the the lab sitting is um, would be my recommendation and again the internships are a great a great way to get your foot in the door yeah, thank you for that. Um, and then, you know, there's a, there's a few similar questions in here. Um, the next one is as it relates to uh, environmental work. So again, if you are interested uh, in the environmental side of marine energy, how would you go about pursuing your career? So LaSalle, Molly, uh, anyone really, but um, you two probably have the most experience in this area. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I mean, I think depending on like your, if you have a master's, to a degree, like for for National Lab, we have internship, what Kelly said, which are a great way. And we also have position for research associate. And most of, I mean, yeah, a lot of people who study National Lab have studied at being a research associate, post-bachelor, post-master, post-doctorate. And that's how I started. Um, and this is a nice way to figure out if, yeah, it's, it's a great experience, a great way to, work in the national lab in a great way to some a lot of people stay you know if they, you do a good job and you have a good project like it's a nice way to stay so i think yeah anything to add on that molly or i think that was good yeah i think just like a little bit more on the like actual environmental or biology side of the work um like sometimes i think about how i spend a bunch of time you know studying what would happen if a tidal turbine were to collide with an animal, right? And that's a very engineering approach. That's sort of like, what is it, what's gonna happen? Like, how does it work? But like, there's actually all these other biological questions that come along with that. Like, how does the animal actually move around the tidal turbine? We don't actually know enough really about whale eyesight to like know if they can like see it. You know, there's like so many basic biology and, and questions and environmental questions that um, are, are still out there and like still really relevant to this industry. Um, and uh, yeah, that expertise is really needed too. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, so um, the next question for Andrew, in your tech role, how much collaboration did you have with the research staff? We had a lot of collaboration. I think the biggest question would be sort of like, how do they communicate to us? Because what we're doing is real world hands-on work and you know, we have to connect sensors and instrumentation and all that kind of stuff. And we would almost have to ask them, what do you need or what do you expect? Or what's the expectation here of how this works together? And some engineers are really trained in how to how to speak to us and some weren't trained as well. And so we kind of had to guide them in the right direction. But our role really was to take their vision and turn it into reality. And that was pretty cool. Like, that job, if you're really into hands-on building things and you like to drive forklifts and hook up wires and like go places and climb wind turbines and for marine energy, all this stuff, that's a great career. And my own 
career now is I was really curious about the data that we were generating. So I kind of like was asking almost too many questions to the engineers and they were like, hey, you should just get your degree and do this for us. So now I'm on the other side and I'm collaborating with the technicians and trying to understand what they need and what questions they have. And it's kind of come full circle for me. So it's a, it's a pretty interesting question, I think, honestly. Hey, Andrew, can you talk a little bit about, um, I'm assuming you're going through NREL's tuition reimbursement program. Can you talk a little bit about that? And um, if, if the other labs wanna chime in on whether you have those opportunities as well, that would be great. Yeah, so for me, I work full time and NREL pays my tuition. And part of that agreement is that I'm kind of using some of that knowledge to further our research. And the other part of that agreement is that I'm not on a specific timeline, which is nice. So I can sort of learn as I go and use my work and school kind of together as like collaborative knowledge. And I think Justin has seen me have conversations where I'm trying to understand something for school, but I can use work as an interesting example and we can all kind of talk about it and learn more. And I think this is one of the areas where the labs can all get stronger if you're kind of like a curious person and you want to learn more. But it's really nice to have the support of the lab in that sense. Yeah, and Kelly, uh, Sandia, um, do you have a tuition reimbursement program too? Yeah, we do. Um, I haven't leveraged it, so I'm not the right person to, to tell you all about it. But um, we certainly have, I, I, I know two colleagues who um, were working for Sandia um, while pursuing masters and PhDs respectively. And um, I don't know the details of all of it, but I, I do know that it, there is a program that CNDA has um, that's similar. Cool, and PNNL, assuming something the same? About the same as Kelly's answer. Okay, great. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's definitely a nice perk for, for working with the national labs is that opportunity to continue pursuing, especially like coming from my perspective, I had just no ties at all to technology, science, anything like that. And the opportunity to then once I've kind of figured out what I'm interested in at NREL and to get a master's um, to pursue something that's actually useful to NREL too, um, you know, later on in life for me, especially, uh, it's a real cool opportunity. So um, little perk for sure. Um, Justin, uh, there's a question for you here. Uh, the question says, I'm also on a car team at my university. What similarities can you draw from that process in your current work? Yeah, so there's actually a lot of similarities, at least that I encounter. Um, I think this, a lot of that comes from the fact that um, in SE Baja, I worked primarily on drivetrain projects. And here on the Hero WEC, our drivetrain and power takeoff is um, one of the most complex components that we have. So being able to design the rotating components, understand bearings, understand the uh, various connector connections that you need, and uh, having that understanding of gearboxes uh, really comes in handy here. And then another similarity that I've noticed is with SAE Baja having the horsepower limit, you're really driven to keep the vehicle as lightweight and small as possible. Uh, with Hero WEC, we have a very small uh, design footprint for it. Yeah. Originally, there was a packaging yeah. or shipping constraint for the device. So being able to uh, visualize how to, or understanding how to make a compact system and what components are useful for that is also very helpful here. Awesome, thank you. Um, so the next is like the million dollar question here. So uh, love everybody to chime in on their opinion on this one because I think there's maybe a, a variety of answers. Um, but what is the current outlook for marine energy power generation, both from a technology and policy standpoint? So where do you see the industry going? Whoever wants to go first, go for it. I'll go. Um, I think this industry in general still has a while to go before it's truly commercializable where like, you know, anyone is like, is getting power uh, just at their house from marine energy. Um, that being said, we're learning a lot from the offshore wind in industry as, as they're growing um, and really trying to look at how, how to make this industry grow, whether that's designing with small scale uses in mind, like the HeroWeck, um, or aquaculture or 
um, ocean observing. And um, I think that's like a, a method where we're getting to iterate faster and figure out um, what things are working and not working faster. Um, so it's still a nascent industry, but that also, as you can see, like brings a lot of opportunity for uh, a lot of different kinds of research and a lot of creativity. Um, yeah, pass to the next person. I'll, I'll try responding. Um, so I think the thing that um, surprised me the most, I'd say when I really started working in this field is that, um, yes, we have technical challenges, like in terms of technology development and having things progress um, to commercialization, but um, a lot of those problems are tractable and they're ones that we have the ability to solve. Um, and from an environmental and permitting perspective, that's not my area of expertise, but I'd say there are certainly some challenges there in terms of um, getting approvals for new technology, right? There's a lot of questions that we can't answer because we haven't done it before. So that's certainly a challenge. Um, but I, I'd say one of the biggest obstacles actually is one that um, I don't see listed here, which is cost, right? That's really, I'd say the, the biggest factor that's keeping us from being a commercial technology. It's not the environmental concerns, it's not the technology itself. It's it's making the technology cost competitive with other forms of energy generation so that you know it makes sense to have you know marine energy in the mix with you know your wind and your solar and your other traditional generation sources. Just to add a bit more on the environmental concern, uh, what Kelly say is, yeah, it's kind of, it slows down the permitting process. And this is why we're pretty much working on this. It's like to help streamlining this permitting process. And I think there are some questions about the policy around that. There's no real policy about marine energy. So we are just trying to better understand how, what we know, like on, on the OES environmental, it's like what we know about other country, how can it be useful for the US to like streamlining the permitting processes? And because we don't have a lot of deployment here, so we just want to learn also from other deployments. Andrew, Justin, your thoughts? The other piece that's exciting and that's coming online soon is there's a so right now in the US, there's one test site, it's called the Wave Energy Test Site, it's in Hawaii. Um, there's gonna be another test site coming online, it's called PacWave South. Um, that's something we need a lot of right now is to do real world testing. Um, the other thing we're figuring out at NREL is how to do laboratory testing and really prepare for the marine environment and run through your whole test case before you deploy your device. So I think my answer would be, Ideally, we get a couple of devices that are strong and stable in the water in the next five years, but I think realistically, we're looking at more like 10 to 15. And I know, Justin, you're so new to this space, but I would love to hear your initial impressions on where you think the industry is going. Um, yeah, that's a challenging one for me to answer because like you said, I'm very new to marine energy. Um, I definitely grew with, um, the emphasis on real world testing and the need for lab testing. So as far as um, what happens with marine energy outside of the national labs, I don't think I have enough information to really have an opinion on where that's going. Um, but with at least what we're doing at NREL, I'm very happy to see the lab testing. And I think that the uh, large amplitude motion platform has given us a lot of capabilities to better understand um, how small WEX perform in different wave cases. We definitely need more smart people too. I think that's the other piece of this is if you're really thinking about solving the climate crisis that we're in, you know, this is an area where Green energy is clean energy, you know, and so it's one of these pieces where it's kind of like this last frontier and it's, from me and Justin's perspective, it's really hard, like the corrosion issues, the how you actually capture the energy and how you turn it into power and how you deploy stuff. There's so many things that we still have to really nail down and figure out for each detail and having a lot of people who are really passionate and smart is so helpful and such like really needed in this industry. 
Yeah, I mean, I see a lot of questions in the chat asking specifically about, you know, is there room for people like in computer science and marine energy? Is there room for people on the environmental regulatory side? Is there work in that area? And, and personally, I see that there's like a real need for almost everything, right? Marine energy is a, a nascent industry and it's going to require tons of research to get it across the finish line. And so, um, yeah, I mean, Hopefully you guys agree with me, but I, I'm kind of trying to answer a bunch of questions in this uh, chat at once, but I do think that there's opportunities if you're passionate, if marine energy is interesting to you, uh, there's most likely space for you in the industry and just uh, making those connections, taking the opportunities that, you know, the folks on this panel talked about that, that might come uh, across your lap would be really beneficial to just, yeah, going for it and seeing what happens. Um, all right, so there's a, there's a specific Seattle question in here. So Pian and all folks, I'm hoping maybe you uh, have some knowledge on this one, but it's a, do you know of any student career days in Seattle that could help me experience, ask, understand more about marine energy environmental careers that could help me understand if it's a good fit for me to study a master degree or sort of not an internship, but something to help decide before an internship. Resources in that area. I don't, Modi, correct me if I'm wrong. I would say the best thing you can do is reach, you know, look at profile of researcher, see if you have someone who like, you know, there is someone who is working on a project that you may be interested in and you reach out to the person with your resume and say that you want to chat with the person. And I usually, you know, we are nice people and we reply and we can take some time, um, yeah. Yeah, same thing that was else said. I was thinking like folks at, at UW who are professors or stuff like that, if you're interested in a master's program, if you say like, I'm interested for these reasons, but kind of curious if this will get me where I want to go. Most professors are, are willing to, to answer those kinds of questions too. Um, and if you're based in the area, might meet with you ahead of time or that kind of thing. Yeah, I'd say it's a small industry and people are pretty passionate about what they do in this industry and also interested in helping people get into it. You know, you just heard Andrew make the plea for, we want more people, more bright people. Uh, we need all sorts of people. So I'd say in my experience, just finding somebody that looks like they might have a career that you're interested in and reaching out, you'll probably, uh, you know, get a response. And if not, just keep trying and finding other people. Um, all right, so uh, another question is, how do you get into environmental policy with a STEM degree? Do you need to pursue masters, PhDs in policy, or can you jump in with a graduate degree in STEM as well? Molly, maybe if you wanna take a stab at that one. Yeah, happy to. Um, I actually did a, a marine policy fellowship, which is somewhat designed for uh, STEM folks, and Michaela did a kind of similar one too. Um, sometimes folks have like more environmental science or, or policy backgrounds that do those policy fellowships, but they're um, kind of designed for that. There's a couple different ones. There's one called, the one that I did is called the Knauss Fellowship. Um, Michaela did one called the Hirschman Fellowship. Both of those are funded by Sea Grant. Um, there's also one called the AAAS Fellowship. That's more broad science, a little bit less brain focused. Um, and all those are really cool because they give you like a cohort of folks who are doing kind of similar work. Um, and that means you can like kind of learn from each other and build from each other. You don't have to like go to your boss and you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, and so uh, that's a really special thing. And, and at least my fellowship, and I don't know if Michaela wants to speak to it too, like some of those folks that I still talk to and ask those kinds of questions. Um, and it kind of gives you a big network across uh, a bunch of institutions. Awesome. Um, all right, another question, and, and Justin, I'm, I'm curious about your perspective on this one. So it's really about the competitive nature of finding internships at national labs. And do you have any advice? Was there anything that you think that you did that worked for you to secure your internship? Yeah, if you want to speak to that, that'd be great. Um, yeah, definitely sounds like the internships are competitive. Um, I've heard of there are generally a lot of applicants. Uh, I think really the thing that uh, what have set me apart is that I saw the posting for the HeroEC internship position, uh, thoroughly researched the project, realized that that was something that sounded very interesting to me. So I had done a bunch of research and read through as many of the published HeroEC documents as I could find before my interviews. 
And uh, I would say that in general, uh, if you're applying for something that you're interested in and passionate about and uh, you feel you're a match for a project, then that's going to help you out. And uh, thoroughly researching the project is also going to be very helpful. I'm not certain how great of an answer I can really give having been only on the uh, side of applying for the internship. Uh, so I don't necessarily know about what all goes on behind the scenes at the National Lab. That's a great segue. So anybody else that's been part of the, the selection committee that can speak to what you've seen in strong applicants that's really kind of set them apart? I would say I once had to review 93 resume for five for like three position I think we had uh, and what the main difference would be a good cover letter there would be that's very important and having a resume that is you know like highlights skills that you have that are tied to also what the internship is proposing um, yeah the strong cover letter is a good thing yeah and I've been on many um interview panels and um, I'm sure each of the labs have different ways of writing job postings, but at Sandia, we have desired and required um, attributes for an applicant or for a posting. And so it's really critical that all of the um, required um, elements are met. So, you know, um, if you don't have those things that makes you automatically, we don't even see the application that doesn't get rooted to us. So that gets screened by HR. So like really look at the at the posting and make sure that you check all those boxes for the required um, qualifications. But the desired, not so much. I, I really wanna emphasize that. That's like a wish list, right? And you don't need to check them all. And you might not even check any of them. Even having interest in some of those desired uh, qualifications, I think can go a long way. So don't be deterred if you don't have all of the desired attributes, but be sure to make sure that you meet all the required ones. And then, you know, like Lisa said, uh, the cover letter is a great opportunity to convey um, why you applied for the position and, you know, your specific interest in it. Um, I'd say, you know, when we see that an applicant has applied to like a hundred different positions across the India, we know that they're not really interested in our position. They just want a position. Um, and so, you know, make sure that you use that as an opportunity to make yourself stand out. Awesome. Um, all right, another question here from, um, from Costa Rica. So uh, this is uh, for Molly or Lucelle, looking at if you were gonna start, begin research related to um, wave energy converters or offshore wind and tropical waters, where would you recommend to even just get started in that research? Um, I would say looking at what has been done uh, yeah, in other countries, it's probably a good thing. And uh, yeah, looking, I mean, if it's like environmental research, um, you know, I worked, like I know who is asking the question. So I I work on like, I've we're starting looking into that, into what are the sensitive habitats, what are the habitats? And I'm talking more about, more like about the environmental side of it. Molly can probably say more about the engineering side of it. Um, we are really looking at um, where is the best place to do it without, you know, like coral reef are already impacted so much by climate change and the, and the fisheries have been like, you know, pretty impactful also. So really trying to make sure that you don't add more on the top of any, everything else. Uh, but I think it's very needed in tropical countries. And we one thing I want to say is that um, we are really US focused because it's, we are under the Department of Energy and most of our research is done in the US. Um, so we are always happy to like collaborate and just, you know, discuss about this kind of research, but we, a lot, most of our, I mean, I would say probably 99% of our project is happening in the US. Yeah, I was thinking kind of like from an engineering standpoint, like you might design, you know, your your how the device connects to the ground differently in, you know, certain environments and that kind of thing. That could be a challenge that you would have anywhere, but you'd want to make it specific for your, your tropical installation. But more from like a kind of a community standpoint, I think it would be really under, important to understand 
sort of like how the community uses the ocean already. Like, is there a lot of recreation or fishing or that kind of thing? And you can kind of make different decisions about what kind of device might be more appropriate for that community based on kind of what already is happening in that community. Um, and that, again, that's probably true for, for most places and not specific to tropical waters, but it's a really important step when you're kind of thinking about these projects. Yeah, thank you both. Um, all right, the next question is for Kelly. Um, looking at Wexim and your career, how did you get into working on Wexim? What are the key challenges that you've had in working on Wexim? Um, and then also asking, you know, what key skills would you recommend mastering if somebody was interested in that space? All right, it's a multi-part question. Let me see if I can address each of these. So, um, so um, I, I went to Oregon State um, to study um, wave energy, and that is how I was I had the minor in ocean engineering, and my thesis was actually on numerical modeling of wave energy converters, um, and essentially kind of like the precursor to what Wexim is now. So that's, um, you know, that's kind of how I started in that path. I was doing that work already through my graduate program, and I presented a paper at a conference, and I was fortunate enough to have um, researchers from Sandia there who approached me and said, hey, we're actually funded to do this work and don't have anyone to do it. Would you want to come to Sandia for an internship? So it kind of fell in my lap in that way, but I was strategic about like pursuing that field of research in the first place. Um, how I ended up working on Wexim at Sandia is that um, Wexim didn't exist when I started at Sandia. I was actually part of the team that um, worked on the scope that created the project that is Wexim, and I've led it at CNDF from its inception. So um, in a way, I kind of helped create it. Um, so that's the answer to that question. Challenges in working on Wexim. Um, I mean, if I'm to be blunt, we have a lot of funding challenges. It's really difficult um, because software requires continual development and support. And, you know, our funding agency doesn't always want to, and, and rightfully so, have you know kind of like an indefinite <laughs> bill that they need to pay to support these uh, resources so that can be a challenge and yet um it's really impactful and so a challenge there is like communicating its impact and kind of justifying its continual development and support um so those are some of the like project management challenges um from a technical perspective um you know there are technical limitations to what we can do within the software um, with the with the theoretical approach that we took, um, and then you know we we have a, a growing team of about you know eight staff members across two labs spanned across the country and internationally, and so you know trying to collaborate effectively, um, to using version control, managing pull requests, all that kind of stuff. Like it requires a lot of coordination. Um, Okay, last question. Key skills you recommended mastering and what are they? Um, I think um, specifically for Wexim, um, I would I think a strong background in, um, in wave mechanics, in ocean engineering, that's great. But we also have people who come from like a computer science background or an electrical engineering background um, who can learn some of that theory. So I honestly think a STEM background in general is, is really beneficial. Um, and a lot of those other skills can kind of be learned. So our team, we have pretty diverse backgrounds. Um, and I think that that has, what ena has enabled our success. Um, but specifically, if you're asking my request, I, I love people who are familiar with using GET, who understand work-based workflows, who um, you know, are willing to kind of like dig in and make contributions to the code, that kind of proactivity um, helps a lot. So sorry for the long answer. It was a multi-part question. <laughs> uh, all good. Um, Andrew, there's a few questions in here about like careers in uh, marine energy that are related to data, computer science, and some just general concerns over like, is there jobs in this? And I think you spoke to it a little bit earlier, but like, where do you see, like, do you see that there's a need for lots of data science in, in marine energy? Um, what advice would you give to somebody looking specifically to get into that? Um, and I think you spoke a little bit to this, but uh, there's a few more questions. So I just wanted to, if you could add anything. Um, 
there is a lot of data challenges with marine energy. There's challenges on the modeling side. There's challenges at scale with the amount of data that we're collecting now. There's challenges with we want to have better fidelity in our, they're called hindcast models, but looking backwards at the waves. Um, there's ways we can do that better. Um, there's ways we can use neural networks and machine learning. Um, there's a big area for to try to figure out how to do the specifics of marine energy better using data. And like how you frame that question, it's almost like an open-ended question, like what should we do? And at NREL, what's really cool is there's me who's, I'm the one data person in our group, but then there's a whole other data science group that I can ask questions to. And there's really smart people in that area. So mostly my own task is to understand our data needs and then realize when we need to reach out and ask bigger questions. And that's where somebody can get plugged in and kind of be the, the subject matter expert. And that's one of the pieces of a data science person or a data analyst is your job is going to be to understand your domain really well. So you can plug in all these tools and our specific job is using Python. And we also use MATLAB and all these other tools and trying to figure out the interest intricacies of these tools and plug them in is really the, the piece that's pretty valuable. That's a great answer. Yeah. And so I think we probably just have one time for one more question. And there's a great wrap up question that somebody just asked in the in the chat. So I'm um, excited that that's uh, going to be a nice segue to us wrapping up. But do want to say that there's a lot of questions on career opportunities and national labs and how to get into that. And after uh, we answer this last question, we're going to show some more slides on uh, different opportunities within the lab. So uh, rest easy, that's coming your way. Um, so yeah, the last question um, that I think any of you could answer is looking at the mobility between industry, university, government, um, working in the marine energy space, how easy it is it to move around. Um, I would also add a little bit to it. I'm curious always like what people think, how easy it would be to move to other industries from marine energy. Are your skills transferable? Um, so just talking through like mobility within the industry, within, um, within uh, tangent industries, uh, internationally, go for it. What are your thoughts on that there? Did that question make sense too? <laughs> I think the question made sense. Um, I haven't had too much experience with moving between uh, universe. I guess I've done university and some different government agencies, and I found that every time I like switched, I had you know more skills and I understood the, a fuller picture. Um, I know that I've seen a lot of colleagues uh, transfer kind of between Europe and the U.S. Um, and, and that's been kind of cool. Like sometimes we'll do like little exchanges, you know, for, for a couple uh, months or a year. Um, so I would say, I would say a fair amount. Um, yeah, pass it on. <laughs> All right, one thing so that um, might be interesting is um, when, you are, when you have a PhD and you can have a joint appointment. Uh, and at least it's the case at PNL. I don't know if it's the case at NREL or Sandia, but so you can, you are like, and Modi has a joint appointment. Actually, you may, Modi, you may no, do you? Because you may be the best person to talk about that. But I am an affiliate researcher. I don't have a joint appointment, but I have, a, I have um, an affiliation for it at Atlantic University. So you are able actually to work, you have, you can wear your university hat or your national lab hat and you're able to work on both sides, which is kind of cool. Um, the mobility, like, I don't know about industry or government, so I won't say too much about this. I would say between countries, um, if it's about the question about working between US and another country, we can't. We went there, yeah, it's like we are, we're stuck here in the US working <laughs> for the national lab, but it doesn't mean that we cannot collaborate with other countries. Like I collaborate with a lot of countries for my project and a lot of research, which is very cool. I do also have an appointment with the University of Washington and that's been great. Like I've used a bunch of their facilities. Um, I'm based in Seattle. And we don't have a lot of lab facilities here. Sometimes we'll go and use their flume or uh, boats or that kind of thing. And that can be really great to help get research done and, and broaden your network.
I mean, I guess I'll just chime in a little bit with what I've seen um, over the years um, with staff, at least at NREL. Like I said, the marine energy community is, uh, it's a small community. And I, I definitely have seen people float from academia to national labs to industry. And I think that, you know, once you get into your field of expertise, it, I've seen that your skills can transfer from, from watching people's careers um, from, from one to another. So um, yeah, that's my two cents there. Anybody have anything else to add to that? I personally don't have anything to add. You know, it's actually kind of a joke with my uh, my close group of friends from <laughs> growing up. Like, I've had the same job since 2011. It's my first and only job, you know? So I think uh, if you're looking for a career mobility, I'm not the person to ask, but I think that does speak to, um, you know, if I, if I wasn't happy, I would have left, so. Yeah, I would guess that the opportunity for collaboration across all these different uh, other, other sectors really helps keep us where we are, right? Like you don't necessarily feel like you're stuck at a national lab because you do get to explore the world through your collaboration. So it's a pretty cool experience. All right. Um, yeah, I think we're right about time to um, wrap it up. So I do want to thank everybody from the panel for participating today. Um, Michaela noted in the chat that if there are unanswered questions that were directed towards any of the panelists, we will make sure that the panelists are aware and can respond to you personally. Um, so we'll get that information your way and your answers uh, to your questions. Um, so Michaela, if you want to share the slides again, and we can walk through the opportunities. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone and uh, stay on while we get the slides and, and we'll show you, point you some, uh, some of the opportunities at the National Labs that we talked about. I think we want to go to the next slide. Awesome. All right. Um, so this is a snapshot of um, the different opportunities. So all of us speaking um, are mostly working on water power technologies office projects funded by the Department of Energy. Um, so uh, the Department of Energy offers um, quite a few different opportunities to get involved um, through, through their programming. Um, we have collegiate competitions, which actually there's a whole slide on, so I'm not going to get into too much detail on what those look like. Um, there is an ORISE Marine Energy Graduate Student Research Program. Um, they're open to doctoral candidates and master's students uh, interested in working in marine energy. That's a six-month placement. I believe they select uh, four or so uh, ORISE uh, uh, students each year. Um, there's the Sea Grant Fellowship as well, and the AAS Science Technology Policy Fellowship. So um, sort of a wide range of uh, different backgrounds uh, that can be applying to these different opportunities. Um, if you go to the next slide. This is just a, this is a, the, the cycle of when you would apply to each of these programs. Um, and we'll share these slides and the recording will be available to all of you so you don't have to memorize this. But, um, and this is all available on the DOE website, but you can see that there's uh, both applications and selections happening throughout the year. So depending on the opportunity that you're interested in, make sure that you take a look uh, at the, the timelines and then uh, you can uh, apply. All right, next slide. Um, so DOE Office of Science internship exchange opportunities. So when uh, we were talking about internships throughout the panel, um, a lot of our experience with interns, uh, at least uh, at NREL, is through the SULI program. Um, so the SULI is available at, I believe, all the national labs. I think we don't have Sandia on here, but I, I believe, Kelly, do you guys have SULI interns as well? We don't have SULI interns, but okay. we have several internship programs that I'll put okay. in the chat. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, so yeah, this is a great way to um, get involved in the national labs. There's uh, usually there's three different terms, the fall, spring, summer term, um, and you'll get access to, you know, working on a research project at a national lab and you'll have a mentor. Um, and we've, I, I, I can speak from NREL, we've hired quite a few Sulis to come on and then be um, researchers at the lab too. So really cool program to get your foot in the door on marine energy. If you wanna go to the next slide. 
Um, so additional opportunities, um, the Office of Science Graduate Student Research Program, um, there's the NREL Director's Postdoctoral Fellowship. Uh, I will say that's a really competitive fellowship program, but um, it is uh, really, you know, if you can get into that, that's it's a great career opportunity for sure. PNNL, Sandia, all have postdoctoral fellowship opportunities as well. Um, and then there's the National Consortium for Graduate Degrees for Minorities in Engineering Science. It's uh, called the GEM program for short. Um, this is a, a really great internship uh, option for uh, minority students. Um, we've definitely hosted um, many students in this program at NREL. Um, really cool opportunity to uh, engage students who may or may not have had any exposure to water power and marine energy. Um, and get them in the door at the national labs. Next slide. All right, uh, Marine Energy Collegiate Competition. Um, as I noted, this is another DOE-sponsored competition um, that is run here at NREL. Uh, it was established back in 2020. We're in our fifth year right now. Um, and this, I know some of you on the call probably are participating in this already, but for those who are unfamiliar, this is open to any school uh, in the world. Um, you get the opportunity to develop a concept of a marine energy uh, device that's powering any application in the blue economy. So it's completely open to uh, your imagination. You get to build and test your device. Um, we help facilitate connections with um, facilities that do have uh, testing capabilities if your school does not have them. Um, and then you get to in person, now that COVID is over, uh, hopefully, um, pitch in person to a live panel of judges um, and engage with other students and industry along the way. Um, applications will open in March for the 2025 competition uh, and everything's run through that HeroX website that's listed on this slide. You can go to the next slide. Some other professional organizations that will really um, could be helpful as you start navigating your careers in marine energy. Um, the first one is INOR. Um, they are a global organization. They do have um, specific country chapters. Um, a really wonderful organization. They host symposiums on a regular basis. They have workshops too. Uh, good opportunity to uh, meet your fellow um, you know, peers that are uh, new to the to the offshore energy space. Um, there's also SNAMI, uh, the Pan American Ocean Energy Student Network. Um, and at the bottom here, we've got the Young Coastal Scientists and Engineering Conference Americas. So um, a lot of these organizations are run around, uh, they uh, wrap around you know, one big conference or event a year, but then you get to stay in touch and network with them throughout the year. So definitely check these out. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, so other ways to stay connected and to learn more uh, in this space. Um, OES Environmental, which I believe there's been links in the chat already about this, but um, really great resources for getting up to speed on what's going on um, across the world um, in the environmental space. Um, Tethys blasts, I um, say it a little bit too much, but these to me are like a Bible on a weekly basis of what's going on um, in the marine energy space. You'll find anything from career opportunities, new research, conferences that are coming out. So um, really, really I recommend check, uh, signing up for those blasts. Um, you can also get the primer blasts, um, which will teach you about you know, up-to-date uh, research that's going on in the marine energy space. Um, we do have primer STEM portals that we host at NREL. Um, these are supposed to be a one-stop shop for learning about marine energy in general, and then how you can navigate a career um, in marine energy. We do have career, um, uh, career charts, career maps that were just added to the panel, which is kind of a cool place to start and look and see, you know, if whatever opportunity you're thinking of in the marine energy space, there's probably information on there and how you would go about obtaining that in for, uh, that career from a um, educational standpoint, and then also learning a little bit about what a day-to-day -day would look like in that job. Um, 
the Triton Project, check that out, sign up for the newsletter. Um, and then also all of our labs do have individual newsletters that come out um, on a regular basis, again, with career opportunities, with uh, information on events coming up, new research. Um, so lots of ways that you can just stay connected, learn more um, about what's going on in this space. Um, I do note that Michaela also added in the, the chat there, the, uh, the UMERC research community is another great space to learn about um, what's going on across universities and national labs. Um, we do post events like this one into there so you can stay connected, um, find out what, what the marine energy researchers are talking about. Michaela, did I miss anything? Nope, I think you got it all. All right. Um, excellent. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, really appreciate this. We will send the link uh, to the recording out to everyone. Really appreciate the panelists for taking the time today to connect with, uh, with all of our interested young professionals. Um, and yeah, have a great day. Thanks everyone.